Hello, everyone. So welcome to the final plenary this week. And I would like to say a couple of words about um, someone that you already know, I think. So what can I say about Harry Kucha Kucha? Well, I can say a lot, but I won't. <laughs> But what I am going to say is that Harry is the best greeter. Because whenever he sees you and greets you, he does a little dance, and he smiles, and you automatically feel very good. And he brightens your day. So that's how I see Harry Kucha Kucha. And you probably know him as past president of IATEFL. Um, and I would like to invite Harry to introduce our final plenary speaker for this week. Harry? Right. At ITFL, we pride ourselves in being a truly international association that brings together people from around the world and celebrates its diversity. But what does diversity mean to us? Today, we are going to be listening at, in this last plenary to a speaker who is a really big name in equity, diversity, and inclusion. I first met Awad in 2017 in Senegal at an Africa Elta conference and his presentation was one of the most fascinating I have ever listened to. And a few years back, his name came up amongst trustees who had also listened to him at Tissot France. Awad has all sorts of accolades. He is a Canada professor in anti-racism at the Faculty of Education in the University of Ottawa in Canada. He's very well known for his work in curriculum theory, particularly in relation to anti-racism and social justice, youth culture, hip hop, and boy, he can dance. <laughs> Diasporic and continental African identities and applied linguistics, and he has written widely, really extensively in these areas. Very recently, he has been professor in residence at the University of Leeds in the School of Education. And also, even more recently, he was appointed vice provost for equity, diversity, and inclusive excellence at the University of Ottawa in Canada. It gives me pleasure to invite my big brother, Awad, and to ask him this question. What has race got to do with an international association such as ITFL. Welcome to the podium. All right, so um, before I begin, let me call on the spirit of my African ancestors. Uh, I am originally from the Sudan um, and if you are following the news, uh, it hasn't been good news uh, lately. So I want to call on the, their spirit uh, to guide us uh, to a peaceful uh, moment uh, for, the, uh, for this, what is supposedly a holiday of Eid, um, and yet it's one of the most uh, awful days. As we always do, uh, first of all, let me, let me say how uh, beautiful it is to see so many of you still here. Um, I expected like 10 or five, and I was like, gonna suggest for Sarah to cancel the session so that we can all head out to get um, the, uh, the trains and uh, wherever we're going. Um, so um, as we always do, and, and, and those of you who are who have been plenaries and, and all of this, I can, I can see Leslie and, and Evan to, can testify to this. Um, you send in an abstract and a title and everything else and to your talk, and then uh, when you are preparing your, your talk, 
um, we started writing it, and you go like, what the hell was that title about? <laughs> um, so I looked at my title, and I was like, yeah, it has what I'm talking about, but I, I think I could be a little bit more sexy. So I changed my title. So, <laughs> and, uh, and it's a direct response to Harry's question. What exactly is race got to do with a very nice organization like IOTEFL? And um, the subheader is uh, subtitle, Intersecting Race, Displacement, Identity, and the Pleasure of Second Language uh, Learning. Uh, before anything, um, I wanna begin with a profound thank you. Uh, and, I, and I mean that in the true sense of the word. Um, and it gives me, uh, a, like it warms my heart that people are still here. Um, I, and I really mean that, it shows commitment to the work, just commitment of the organization, and, um, and, and, um, and, and all of this. And, and so clearly I've, I've been, it's my first time like, uh, like um, uh, Professor Garcia, um, and I literally just found myself going like this to myself, and I'm going, why haven't I been here before? Um, I should have been here uh, a little bit earlier. So as a hip hop scholar, um, we don't clap, okay? I, I don't know if you know what hip, -hop's, hip, hip hop or hip hoppers do. What we do is we snap our fingers, okay? So uh, once, in a, once in a blue moon, once in a while, I'm gonna ask you to snap your fingers. I wanna begin with a profound thank you, not only to the organizers, Sarah, uh, David, um, uh, and, and I have uh, pretty much all of the organizers and Harry and, and all of you uh, present and past pre presidents. But I also pr want to um, kind of give a, a big shout out to, you know, the people who are sitting outside, uh, the volunteers. I really, really want us to snap their, your, our fingers to them uh, because they are the ones who are making things happen. And I really, really appreciate uh, that and for those of you who have organized conferences, you know how much time and energy it takes uh, to put things together. So this is would be my call or response, and I hope you will respond to me once in a blue moon. I will say, can we give um, can we give it a try? And that is, can we snap our fingers? Uh, can we give it a good try? I'm I'm glad we could do that. Appreciate that. After all, this is uh, the final uh, session, and for God's sake, let's have a little bit of uh, fun, okay? Um, so I, uh, I, I, I wanna thank uh, particularly David um, and uh, Professor uh, Garcia and um, uh, for uh, the amount of work that they have done, and particularly Professor Garcia touched on a few things that I would love to, um, to touch on and kind of work with. Um, for I have been to a few sessions and I attended uh, plenaries. And there's a lot of focus on uh, students, uh, techniques, um, and so on and so forth in terms of teaching. Um, so I wanna flip it. I wanna flip the, the, the script, as, as we say in hip hop. And when you flip the script is you go upside down, okay? So instead of pointing our fingers to um, learners, I want us to th focus, this particular presentation is about us, teachers, okay? Because the best thing that, the best gift that we can give to our students is ourselves. So the more conscious, the more aware we are, the, the better we will be. So I set up a, um, uh, an agenda. Um, and I have three things that I would love to share with you, and this is what Paulo Freire would call treasures. Um, by treasures, I'm not assuming that people do not know because I'm talking to highly intellectual people, highly intelligent people, but um, sharing with you what I know, uh, hoping that it will, be, it will uh, resonate with you. So the first, um, I, w I want us to, um, I wanna focus on the link between race and language in particular, um, and so that would be my first agenda, is to argue that race, specifically blackness, works like a language. And that's a central argument that I'm, I'm gonna put forth. 
Indeed, I will conclude that race is language, situating my arguments primarily within social linguistics to argue that race works like a language, then blackness speaks, it minoritizes. And in a place like the UK, it controls. This argument is particularly significant in a post-George Floyd moment. In a post-George post, uh, Floyd moment, I'm arguing we came to realize that language also mythologizes, a key word in, in, my, in my work, and creates monsters who are in need to be controlled. Because if you don't control the monster, the argument goes, then you are calling for chaos. The second argument uh, that I'm putting forth as an agenda to fully grasp this idea that race works like a language, we need to expand the notion of language itself and move it away, and this is what Professor Garcia was touching on, but not in the strict sense, uh, from the Saussurian notion of language and bring it closer to semiotics uh, or semiology, where the black body is a language with its own phonetics and syntactic structure. And the last item is introduced very briefly in uh, my own work, uh, where, we, where I talk about the link between second language identity, second language learning identity, and, and hip hop. So, um, are you ready? Can we get, can you snap your fingers? Through time and growth, they'll start to see the differences. My patience may be wearing thin, but my skin is thick. My reality is rich, and I'm not referring to the pounds in my purse, I'm referring to my worth. Sex, drugs, and money barricaded in these illusions, drowning out all the confusion, trying to fuck up these institutions. We wear our scars like we're screaming a battle cry. We ready our weapons at the sound of a siren, alien, transcendent, unknown. You must step into these territories in order to grow. There is no map. You cannot plan. Run towards the land. Seize freedom in your hands. Never again will we allow such an injustice. I will not stand in the way of my destined path. I will not be stopped until I am ripped from this earth. I am in control of the future that I deserve, and I don't look to society to affirm my worth. Rise, kings. For you are all amazing and incredible. Because you found a way in from a way out of the system that had you caged in, I look to you and say, and I could have just let you watch it and then I stop, right? So I, I, don't, I don't need to say anything more. What we have just witnessed and, I, and, um, and the trying, in trying how the, the, to, to work the website, there's a few seconds in the, in the first video uh, that we're missing. Um, is exactly what my presentation is about. Um, Race works like a language. Stuart Hall argues that race works like a language and signifiers gain their meaning not because of what they contain in their essence, but in the shifting relations of difference, which they establish with other concepts and ideas in a signifying field. Their meaning because it is relational and not, in, not essential, can never be finally and transhistorically fixed. That is, there is always something about race left unsaid. In the Caesarian linguistic tradition, to argue that race works like a language is to presuppose that race has a syntax structure uh, syntactic structure, grammar, morphology, phonology, message, receiver, and speaker. And although Stuart Hall in his quote is interested in the excess of race, that is, that which cannot be formulated neatly in language, the leftover, uh, the unsaid, I, on the other hand, am interested in race as language, specifically on the phenology of race, how we speak it 
what we say through our bodies and what our bodies say to others. Clearly, we do not have control over what our black bodies, and here I'm speaking, this body that is speaking, uh, we, don't have, we do not have control over what those bodies say. They are open for different readings, translation, and interpretation. As such, we speak race as much as it speaks us. Can I get a witness? You're following me? Uh, so succinctly, what does it mean to argue that race, namely blackness, works like a language? It means eight things, and I'm going to walk you through uh, those eight things. That blackness is an empty signifier. That blackness is an empty signifier. Blackness has no inherent meaning. This is because objects do not mean. People put meaning onto them. In this sense, blackness is whatever we think it is. If this is the case, then blackness is a symbolic capital whose meaning and value can only be determined within a particular market, within a signifying economy of exchange. If we take the UK, US, or Canada, as examples or as symbolic markets of linguistic exchange, then blackness is the marked signifier and whiteness is the unmarked signifier, the transcendent, the universal signifier. In this sense, whiteness becomes the signifying subject while blackness becomes the signified other. Number two, if we assume that uh, race works like a language, then blackness is not a possession. It's not something we have. It is not, it is only a relational. That is to say, blackness is meaningful only in relation to other categories, whiteness, brownness, and so on, on the one hand, and in relation to other identity categories like gender, class, sexuality, ability, and, and other. Are you following me? Can I get a witness? Three, to argue that blackness is a discursive category, uh, so black, to argue that race works like a language, then blackness is a discursive category, a social script, an unofficial but firmly expected role we play, a plot, a representational language that is beyond our individual control, and since, as Monique Wittig has argued, quote, there is no nature in society, it is a historical, political, and social product. In this sense, blackness is a performative category, a language we speak every day in how we dress, how we walk, how we talk, in our hair, in our makeup, and I am performing blackness right now. Put otherwise, blackness transcends the individual. It is a norm, a language we enter, as it were, at birth and through repetition, recitation, identification, marking, and everyday compulsory and normative acts, one eventually, and I emphasize this, eventually becomes black. So, if this is the case, and if you accept my argument that race works like a language, then no one is born black, where one becomes black. We are born, period. But because we are born into a society, a language, we embody that language as, it, as our own. It becomes our mother tongue. This is how we become black. We become black by speaking blackness as a mother tongue. A black person is a black person because she speaks blackness from birth. Here, language forms as much as it performs identities. That is, we represent ourselves and identities in and through language, uh, but as we are doing that, we also 
form our identities. Language has the double task of representing and expressing identities as well as forming and performing identities. Um, if that's the case, and this is a side note, but it's a very central side note. Um, are you ready for this? I hope you are. Okay. So, no one, I'm arguing, is born white. Period. We are born. Whiteness is a language that white people speak. It is a language that has its own syntax, morphology, phonology. Whiteness is language that white people speak from birth. Now, given the historical moment in which we live, especially in post-George Floyd moment, white people need to ask themselves, what is that language we speak? How do we speak it? And what is that history of that language? So, if you accept my argument that race works like a language, however, uh, back to the question of identity, we do not just perform our identities, um, our blackness, for example, as we wish. Because it is historically and socially produced category, blackness is not a totally free-floating free signifier. Power intervenes and closes the meaning of the object, as Michel Foucault has argued. So blackness becomes a closed canvas, an already signified signifier. When power intervenes and closes the meaning of blackness, three things happen. And I hope you're ready for them. One, blackness finds itself sealed in objecthood, uh, where its meaning is closed and its multi-ethnic, multinational, multicultural, and multilingual nature is negated. Blackness is no longer a free-floating signifier of a multiple and contested side of meaning. Um, it becomes instead one, and one is already uh, known. If you accept the argument that um, uh, power intervenes and closes the meaning of blackness, then uh, when power uh, intervenes and closes the meaning of blackness, blackness is defined and hence treated as a lack, a negative symbolic capital and other, that which is not white, tr the transcendent. The ironic thing after George Floyd murder, white people discovered that th this is how they used to think. The one way out of this thinking, I would suggest, is for uh, all of us, but particularly white people, to take their ignorance seriously. And when the meaning of blackness is closed, then this body standing before you that is no longer representing only itself. It becomes a representation of a race and a whole ancestors. Can I get a witness? To argue that, work, that race works like a language is to expand the meaning of the very category we are dealing with, uh, and that is language itself. We need to take language away from the Sasurian and bring it to se closer to semiotics. Within semiotics or semiology, the least of what people say and speak is through the verbal utterance. Language is more than what people say. That is, most of what we communicate is nonverbal, and we already know this, through our bodies, clothes, hair, makeup, and so on and so forth. Ronald Bart called these signifiers. In a semiotic sense, language does not work in a mimetic or mimesis. That is to say, like a mirror, where the faithful, there is a faithful correspondence between one-to-one uh, uh, one between language and so-called the real world. Here, language does not work by simply reflecting or imitating the truth uh, that is already out there and fixed in the real world. This is because meaning does not lie in the object uh, or event, 
and as Stuart Hall has, had argued, things do not mean we construct meaning using a representational system. If this is so, then the meaning um, uh, lies at the borderline between language system and social actors. From a social linguistic um, perspective, um, to, to our, uh, from a social linguistic perspective, blackness should be approached and understood as meaningless. That is, we construct its meaning. Let us take George Floyd as uh, murder as an example, and link it to our discussion on language. George Floyd was killed, I want to argue, precisely because white social actors, the eyes and the writers of power in North America, closed the meaning of blackness. Blackness is no longer an empty signifier open for different interpretations. It is a closed one, and it is closed mostly in nihilistic and negative sense. Blackness is now a narrative, a mythology, a monster in need of control. Just compare the reaction of the police and FBI in relation to Black, Life Matter, Black Lives Matter protest versus the January 6th insurrection in the US Capitol. A black person no longer represents only him or herself, she represents a whole racial group. A black person is now a mythologized narrative, mostly negatively. Once you create a mythologized narrative around the person, their bodies are part of that mythologizing. In the case of, in the case of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor and so many others, this mythologized narrative has created an out of control menace, a semiotics of a violent body that needs to be imprisoned or otherwise taken out of society by murdering it. Just watch the video of or the murder of George, George Floyd and you will see a faceless, physically menacing body of a black person who needs to be controlled. I have to warn you, uh, the following pictures are really painful to look at. If the black body is not controlled, you will never be sure what it will do. This is what I'm calling mythologized, semiotic narrative of the monster. Here, it is worth noting that the black body points to the présence africaine, that is the African presence in the West, the history of the Middle Passage, slavery, colonialism, and a history that a lot of people pr prefer not to deal with or not talk about or put under the rug. After all, how much of the violent, uh, of the UK violent murder, colonial, colonial and enslavement history is taught and talked about? I'm just saying. Can I get a witness? Finally, uh, to summarize, if meaning does not lie in the object, um, and then blackness is an empty signifier unless it is perceived and acknowledged um, and situated within a historical, social, political, symbolic, and signified system. This system is performed uh, in the grammar of the everyday, and its meaning is both unconsciously internalized and fixed through an exercise of power. Outside of this grammar, blackness is stripped of any market value. This is precisely the reason why my emphasis in my own research is not about race per se. It is about racialization. That is the process of becoming. Um, and on racism, not race, however we define race. In fact, according to my research, only within the signifying economy can blackness gain any value. And given its performative nature, this value is never changing. It's ever changing, I'm sorry. 
in some read as language blackness then is a complex syntactic, morphological, phonological, and semantic system that is forever dual, conscious and unconscious, forming and performing, constructing and representing. So what's all this has to do with my work? Are you ready? So enters my work. In North America, I have argued for, the, for, the, for close to uh, 20, uh, 20 years, by the way, check out those two books that will change your life. Uh, blackness is an all-encompassing figure, a colossal um, umbrella. So when the population I have been researching who are black immigrants, um, namely continental Africans, and you know them extremely well here in the, in the UK, came to North America, so when they came to North America, both in Canada and the US, they were subsumed under this umbrella of blackness. In other words, they fall under the narrative of blackness. However, when they first arrived, they had no idea of what it really means to be black in America, for example, or Canada. So they enter, and this is very significant, the process of what I call becoming black. They start by understanding the narrative and the mythology that was created around blackness. So psychically, they find themselves caught between their cultural and linguistic background on the one hand and their encounter with blackness on the other. They end up creating a third space that does not fully belong to America nor to Africa, um, but the two combined. The psychic process of identity formation ends up creating what I'm calling the rhizome of blackness. So what is the rhizome? The rhizome are the roots of the tree which we cannot see. Black immigrants might look black on the surface in front of the mythology and the law of blackness, but their blackness is more complicated than what the eye can see or what we see on the surface. So in the case of black immigrants, the rhizome of blackness calls for a more complex, complicated, multidimensional, multicultural, multilingual, and multinational category of blackness. The rhizome of blackness disrupts the unidimensional, the mythologized notion of blackness Blackness has always been multiple. Um, these are my conclusions. I, I have six of them uh, from my research. One, and, and I hope you're ready for this one. There are no black people in Africa. In Africa, we are Wolof speakers, we are Kamerone, we are Zulu, we are Dinka, and so on and so forth. In other words, there are adjectives that describe you. However, once in North America, all of these adjectives, all of these descriptors are subsumed under the umbrella of blackness. You are black, you are seen black, therefore you are. Two, big conclusion. Black immigrants have little understanding of blackness. They had um, little understanding of the grammar of blackness how to speak it. So when they arrive to North America, they enter the process of what I call becoming black. That is, they translate and make sense of what it means to be black while negotiating their sense of self. In doing so, they complicate the category of blackness itself. They make it rhizomatic. Three, becoming black meant uh, learning not the standard ESL, but BESL that is black English as a second language. But they are learning black English or BESL precisely because they are becoming black so we enter a vicious cycle. Four, conclusion. Um, identity is directly implicated in what we learn, how we learn, what we learn, and why we learn what we learn. In the case of black immigrants, they are learning black English as a second language, which they access in and through hip hop. That's how hip hop comes back. 
and other black cultural form, bl particularly black uh, popular cultural forms, precisely because this is where they see themselves mirrored and represented. That is, when they are locked out of public spaces where you cannot see yourself reflected anywhere, you would look for spaces where you see yourself represented and mirrored. In the case of black immigrants, it is, bl it is in blackness, in hip hop identity, in black pop culture in general where they invest their identities. Hence the journey of becoming black and learning black English as second language. So I am concluding that our ESL students, and this is a big conclusion, um, are no longer learning their ESL in our ESL classrooms, but they are actually learning them through pop culture, music, social media, films, and so on and so forth. If this is the case, then what we are doing, what are we doing in our ESL classrooms? Maybe we can discuss this in the Q&A if there's time. Fifth conclusion, when it comes to curriculum, black popular culture and hip hop in particular, they both emerge as a site or sites of learning. Um, uh, sixth conclusion, this, that, that was the fifth, this is the sixth one and the last one, immigrants are not refugees. We tend to mix the two, particularly in the US. A resident of a um, rich place, um, you can be from uh, wherever, um, and coming to, um, you know, uh, Harrogate or, or Belfast uh, with $250,000 is an immigrant, while an Ethiopian or wherever you, find, you, you come from who comes to the shore of the Italian island of Lampedusa with an unmarked boat is a refugee. She didn't leave home. She had to flee home. Home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you. Fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. And even then, you carry the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in airport toilets, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand that no one would put their children in a boat unless the sea is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the gallbladder of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences, wants to be beaten, wants to be pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is safer than 14 men who look like your father, no one could take it, could stomach it. No one skin would be tough enough. The go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, niggas with their hands out. They smell strange, savage, messed up their own country, and now they want to mess up ours. How do the words, dirty looks, roll off your back? And maybe it's because the blow is softer than a limb torn off. Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs. Or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home. But home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs. Leave your clothes behind. Crawl through the desert. Wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hungry, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home unless home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. So Harry asked me, what is race got to do with Ayatollah? My response is, hope every, is an eight stands of hope. everything. Thank you. Thank you.
let's leave with a lot of hope.